Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the fourth episode, number four of the talk show. So today we have all the way from the US, we have Dr. Richard Kaczynski. Welcome, Dr. Richard. Thank you for having me. So just a brief introduction and biographical background. Dr. Richard Kaczynski is a prominent writer, academic, occultist, and musician from the US. He attained his PhD in social psychology and worked as a professor and researcher for many, many years. As an author, he has released notable books such as Further Rubble, The Life of Aleister Crowley, and Forgotten Templars, The Untold Origins of the Ordo Templi Orientis, amongst others. In addition, uh, there you go, the books. <laughs> In addition to being a practitioner of Talima within the Western magical tradition, Dr. Gazinski has contributed and edited numerous articles to several magazines while also appearing on television. Finally, a little known big fact is that he recorded keyboards on musical releases by bands such as House of Usher, Page and Celestial Serenity. I have that over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Dr. Richard Kaczynski, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you so much. I am doing well. And good morning and good evening. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, first of all, is there anything you have not done <laughs> from that biography? Oh, there are many things uh, I, I have not done, but hopefully I'll get to them uh, in this lifetime. Yeah, anything you have not done besides uh, carving pumpkins? <laughs> oh, um, yeah, most of my goals at this point are either related to carving more pumpkins um, or uh, just, you know, book projects that I want to try to get to as time permits. Uh, there's just not enough time in the day, you know, so it's... Research, researching this stuff takes some takes a lot of time, and uh, yeah, just just finding the time to do do the various things, you know, just to do the day job and the writing and the music and the pumpkins. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, first of all, to start, I mean, we are, I mean, global, globally, worldwide. Uh, I think many many of us, most of us, are going through very very difficult, strange times very trying times in different industries and different way of uh, living. You know, it's something I think most of us have not experienced to this extent collectively. Um, so from your background, from your expertise, uh, your experience as well, personally and collectively, um, how important do you think psychological well-being is right now? Oh, it could be. It couldn't be more important, and it couldn't be a more challenging time to maintain well-being. Um, I know at um, my place of work, um, be, because you know of my, of my background and all my the people I work with have a background in psychology. Um, there's just been this movement um, to try to have these like well-being or well-being seminars for fellow employees to be able to drop in and just and try to figure out how to cope with the situation that we're in. And um, it's been kind of interesting because I've, I've heard sessions um, for, on, on well-being that sound remarkably like magical practices that I've been doing my whole life. Um, you know, these, and this, you know, can can vary from just exercises and being in the moment, and and just this whole sort of mindfulness idea that's you know goes back to you know Buddhism, um, but also just you know just trying to find something positive in every day, no matter how small it is. Um, you know, an exercise in gratitude, um, exercise. You know, exercises in relaxation. You know, I've, I've seen have been just the typical sort of, you know, grounding before you banish sort of exercises, you know, 
imagine yourself as a tree with your roots going into the ground and your you know, and branches coming out, you know, extending to the sky and, you know, absorbing the rays of the sun and strengthening your body. And it's just like, I, I've been doing this all my life, you know, <laughs> relaxation exercises that, that, I, that I've always done before astral projecting. So I think in, in some ways, I've kind of had extra you know, advantage in these things sort of being part of my daily practice. But at the same time, it's very interesting to see these ideas being, um, you know, proposed and advocated um, in the psychological arena, not in the metaphysical arena. So it's, and uh, I, you know, I hope it's, you know, helping, you know, to do, to do, you know, for people to, to deal with this because, you know, we're, again, many of us are socially isolated. Um <clears throat> Or, or there are people who may be isolated with people they don't particularly get along with so well. Um, that's not my situation, but you know, I know there are concerns about you know, the possibility of increased domestic violence uh, because people are home and have no place to, to get away to. Um, so yeah, I mean, well-being is definitely something we all have to, we are all struggling with. and helplessness, depression, lack of focus, these are all very common symptoms that we, you know, that, that I think we all, that many of us share. Yes. So you've mentioned um, quite a few techniques over there, a few methodologies. Um, is there anything else um, besides mindfulness, besides exercise, which people can engage in? Um, especially if they have a certain kind of uh, mental illness or in uh, disharmony. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing I might, you know, actually two things I might suggest. You know, one is to um, you know take some time and and educate yourself because um, I think so, one of the things that's so frightening about being in the middle of a pandemic is it's this fear of the unknown. It's like, oh my gosh, what's happening? What's going to happen? What will happen if I get this? Um, you know, is this being blown out of proportion? Is it not being made, being made, made enough of a big deal? Or, you know, are people not taking it seriously enough? And, um, you know, in an educating yourself, I would encourage that people go to a reputable source of information, something like, you know, the CDC, you know, here in the U.S. or the World Health Organization, um, you know, vetted professional organizations, not YouTube videos that some random person posted, um, and, and try and find evidence that, you know, that the, try and find the information repeated in more than one reputable source. And just, just having a sense of, you know what what's happening what are the risks and how to mitigate the risk and manage things because then then that gives you a sense of power I, I can i can control this i can you know wash my hands i can socially distance i can wear a mask and and then that gives you the power rather than you feeling powerless um and another thing one might be careful about is you know too big a diet of social media it really seems like social media these days is really just all about creating conflict and divisiveness and and questioning um, what we know from science and authority and um, you know that's and that's that's just not going to help you know I mean unplug and get away from the stress machine and just get out in the world whether whether the world be within your home or you're going out to a park by yourself you know and keeping social distance just to, you know unplug a little. You don't don't feed into, you know that that you know outrage machine. Yeah, I think that's very useful. Uh, this will be very useful for a lot of the viewers. I mean, um, alongside mindfulness, which you mentioned, relaxation techniques, exercise, you have this idea of um, having social media detoxes, and at the same time, also educating ourselves. Maybe do some research, do some reading whether it's formal or whether it's just leisurely, you know, just to get our mind off certain things because it's already quite challenging for many people at home or at the workplace. So it's, it's good to be able to get in the zone to find our center again, as you mentioned, the analogy of the tree, 
very, very important in our times. So, um, yeah, I'd like to m move on into uh, some of the some of your writings you have done. Um, I mean, you are known to be to have produced the greatest biography on Alistair Crowley. Uh, in a few words, how would you introduce Mr. Crowley to a curious seeker who hasn't heard about him before? Well, the for for me, I would say that Crowley is an interesting figure who, in one lifetime, has managed to live multiple lifetimes, um, and has excelled in areas ranging from chess to mountaineering to poetry to occultism to you know philosophy, espionage, even um, just you know, there's just so many sides to this person that um, it's just it's fascinating to see all of that packed into a single lifetime and even when while Crowley may be controversial to some depending on your viewpoint and, and take on the facts of his life I, I think we can all agree that it's a heck of a story one way or another and um, you know one of the things that I find most interesting about Crowley is that he he saw himself as the proponent, the promoter of a new way of looking at life and philosophy and existence in this world. And that is a mission that he never strayed from throughout his life. You know, he had inherited a fortune and he spent through it doing what he considered to be the great work. And even when he fell on harder times later on in his life, you know, he never stopped that mission, which I think speaks a lot to his sincerity in thinking that he was on this. Welcome back. We are having technical difficulties today. No idea what caused. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we have Dr. Kaczynski, we were speaking about Alistair Crowley. And you were sharing a few words. I mean, Mr. Crowley is a very eccentric individual and has a very colorful personality, which goes along with the history as well. Um, so in order to move on from his introduction of, 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 of him, um, as a practitioner, in all your years of studying and practicing within the Western magical tradition, particularly with Thelema, what could you share with us? Um, how has it contributed to your spiritual growth? And also would like to share some of your realizations and expectations and experiences. Uh, um, I think one of the, the most useful things I've, I've gotten out of this is the idea that, it, that one can apply an empirical method to one spiritual practice. So the idea that if you, that a, a really disciplined approach that involves taking notes, making records, learning things, do, doing things in a repeatable sort of way um, allows you to evaluate what works and what doesn't work. And that may change, you know, or vary from individual to individual, but through this sort of systematic process of testing and, and, and critical evaluation, you can kind of hack your way through the, the woods and find you know, the, the techniques and the tools that work for you to get the most out of um, you know, this, this path. And um, you know, I, I often wonder, does, does, did following this path um, you know, make me more you know, disciplined and organized? Um, or was it that I kind of came to this as kind of a disciplined and organized person, and therefore this this approach appealed to me? And I, you know, I kind of tend to think more of a ladder. And you know, and I think it's useful to acknowledge that you know there isn't a one size fits all answer to spirituality. I mean, in this world, we're all individuals. And there's, we have different strengths and weaknesses and interests and passions. And that the, the goal of these systems is to bring us into closer contact with 
our own potential or with the divine or whatever you want to call that for, for just different paths to getting there. And, you know, we try to find the one that suits us the best. And it just happens that this, that this, you know, approach of Western esotericism and specifically, you know, Crowley's idea of scientific illuminism um, just really appealed and resonated to me. Yes, that's a interesting sharing from your own experience. Uh, scientific illuminism, very interesting term. Would you like to share with us a bit about scientific illuminism? Um, yeah, I mean, when Crowley published a, a journal uh, called the Equinox, and the motto of this journal, which, which included all kinds of things, was poetry and plays and essays, and while well, it's primarily an occult journal, it was also, you know, an artsy kind of journal as well. But its motto was the method of science, the aim of religion. And so the idea was that one could apply the scientific method to, again, one's spiritual work. Um, Crowley doesn't actually say a whole lot about how to exactly do that, other than like keeping a journal and being critical, you know, in, in evaluating your own work. Uh, but as someone whose professional career, you know, has involved teaching research design and methodology and statistics, um, this this came very naturally to me. And just there's just this idea that you know when you're doing science, you know, just the idea of what's a hypothesis. How do you test a hypothesis? You know, what is what is evidence? What's the probability that your hypothesis is right or wrong? Um, and you know, the, this idea that there may be other explanations for the results that you are seeing, and to be able to know what what these common you know competing explanations or threats to internal validity, which is you know, the, the jargon term. Uh, but being able to apply all that to saying, gosh, you know, did, did this exercise I do really result in what I thought? Or is there something else going on in the world to explain things? You know, um, just, you know, just in this example, you know, here in the, in the U.S., you know, uh, and I guess in many other countries around the world, that great governments have sent out checks to people to... Um, make up for the fact or to compensate for the fact that economies around the world have just basically shut down. Many, many people are out of work. So if you're a, you know, desperate, hard on your luck magician who is suddenly out of work and you do a magic ritual to get money and then suddenly, boom, there's, you get this check from the government. Is that really due to the work that you did? Or is it the fact that everyone else in your city got a check too. And there's something else going on that it has nothing to do with, you know, the, the work that you did. So that's kind of an example of just that sort of, you know, critical evaluation, you know, um, using a very mundane kind of example. But uh, that's kind of the heart of um, scientific illuminism, just to use the tools of, um, you know, empiricism and, and research design and methodology to take a critical look at your own work and whether you're, really succeeding in what you're trying to setting out to do or whether you're kind of getting fooled by the data. Yes. Empiricism, logical methods, practicality, you know, experimentation, you know, all these techniques you were mentioning, this methodology is very important to test it with our experiences with a certain working hypothesis and at the same time being open-minded with evolving you know, with, uh, with new data coming in, with new experiences, and taking that into account is very important, not only from a, you know, not only from a magical perspective or scientific perspective, but I think just in daily life, in everything we do, you know, to have our heart in the right place and to use our brain, <laughs> you know, not to, it has to come in balance, you know, this groundedness mm -hmm. at the same time with some idealism at the same time, a kind of a vision, visualization, but also grounded practicality is very important in our times. Um, from a sociological or psychological perspective, uh, we see many people over the years getting attracted to the mystical, the magical, 
the esoteric and the occult. Um, what draws them to this genre or this way of living? Um, you know, it's it's interesting, you know, because there's this this there's this idea in in the academic study of Western esotericism of disenchantment, the idea that um, as science and enlightenment has marched on, that the superstitions of the old ways, you know, have fallen, and people have become more rational and all of this, and it's in a way kind of a false dichotomy because. You know, it's built on the premise that th this interest in these practice, these spiritual sort of practices that we're talking about, are in some way irrational and unenlightened, and that really doesn't seem to be the, the case. Um, I I recall a program um, where um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think who the the, the guy was. Um, He, he was the fellow who did the, the documentaries on Joseph Campbell, but this is his own sort of exploration of spirituality. And he, and he talked about this idea of the sniff test, the idea that, you know, dogs can find out a lot of things about the world through their noses. You know, they smell everything and that gives them a lot of information. Now that is a very useful tool, but the sniff test is not the right tool to use if you're trying to answer questions about God. You know, you need right. to use a different tool for that. And um, I think that's a really useful metaphor. And I think about that in, in, with the question you just asked, the idea that um, these, this, this approach, the spirituality, these, this, this mysticism or occultism and these exercises um, appeal to needs that we have or, or, or offer a path that science alone isn't satisfying. And that if, because it, because it was satisfying, we wouldn't need to be looking elsewhere. We wouldn't need to be looking in this other way. And, you know, the, the fact that you may be drawn to these things doesn't mean that you're anti-scientific in any way. Um, it just means that there's another aspect of your being that you're finding um, answers to. Um, you know, and whether, whether you see that as exploring, you know, a spiritual world or whether you see that as using techniques to kind of better understand your internal world, you know, psychologically speaking, um, you know, those, those both seem to be perfectly valid ways to kind of get to know the world better in addition to or complementary to what we know from science. Yes, that's really interesting. Um, you know, a lot of these magical methods, ancient med uh, magical methods, if I may add, have worked over time in different traditions, you know, passed over from the Babylonians uh, to the Egyptians, you know, I mean, not necessarily directly, but even co-currently or simultaneously at different points in history. Uh, the Greeks, you know, the, the, you know, even the golden age of Islam, through the, um, you know, even the Latin world as well, you know, and we have all these uh, various manuscripts and treatises and different books, you know, which have been composed, at least in the Western tradition, um, you know, some dating earlier, but a lot during the 1600s and 1700s. So very interesting time because that also came about during the, scientific revolu uh, revolution in some ways, the uprising of the scientific organization against the Roman Catholic rule, at least in the Western world in Europe. So it's an interesting time, uh, very fascinating as well. And, um, you know, different scholars and practitioners were using this empirical, theoretical, technical methods as well, even though if it's not recognized from the scientific, the mainstream scientific community back then, as it is right now, or even the religious institutions. But still, there were practitioners underground, some of them more popular than others, who were revising a lot of these ancient manuscripts and modernizing it within the current settings at the same time. So, yeah. living tradition. Well, yeah, I think a couple of great examples of that are 
just the sorts of, um, you know, herbal sorts of approaches to medicine that, that spring up around the practice of mid, midwifery um, in the Middle Ages or just the, the practice of, you know, Chinese or Eastern medicine, which, you know, again, a huge per percentage of the, the world subscribes to, but in, the, in terms of Western science, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of examples of that that we can, we can point to. Yeah, definitely. So moving on, um, you express a lot of satire and humor and comedy in some of your writings and also on your so in your social media presence how important is this element in our daily lives well, I, I i personally find humor to be essential um and i i particularly find it to be very healthy to have a sense of humor about our, our sacred cows if, if you know to use that you know term um, you know, I, I am very serious about what I do, but that doesn't mean I can't see the humor in it. And, um, again, I'm, I'm reminded of a quote from John Cleese of Monty Python, who, and I don't know if this is originally from him, but I have heard this quote attributed to him, that too many people mistake being serious for being somber. And, um, you know, that's, that's just me to a T. I mean, I, 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 you know, I just love the humor in the world. You know, there's there, there's this idea that, you know, while while the first trance of uh, of Buddhism, you know, the first noble truth is, is dukkha, that you know, all is sorrow. Um, that beyond that, you know, there's this recognition that it's all pretty funny too, <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of live in that world. And um, particularly with you know social media it's so much of it is toxic and hostile and divisive and that's just something i just don't want to play into and so when i'm on social media i i do one of two things i'm either posting informational stuff um things things in my areas of expertise whether it be the occultism or Crowley studies or some other aspect of academia or meet prog rock or what have you um, Or it's just it's just silly stuff because I think we need more of that in our lives and You know the, at least the people who follow me on social media seem to appreciate that You know, every once in a while I'll get someone that will go why why don't you post something serious? And it's like well, that's that's what my books are for you know if you want serious you can get you know, like more footnotes than you could possibly digest without falling asleep <laughs> um, but you know, social media is just, it's, 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 for me, it's just, it's a place to be kind of lighthearted. Um, you know, when I lose my sense of humor, then I've lost everything. You know? Yeah, it's really important, especially, um, you know, some people might think it's a form of, uh, you know, escapism, but I, I don't really see it like that. I think some of us, we are able to use it as a form of dealing with the situation in a, in a lighter mood, you know, in, in, in a healthier mood. Yes, I mean, comedy is a way of being able to bring up and talk about uncomfortable things. And rather than being uncomfortable because you're bringing up something kind of in a straightforward way, um, you're bringing up in a humorous sort of way, and so you can kind of laugh about it and kind of diffuse some of that tension. Um, and also, I think just in general, humor, the reason something is funny is because it causes you to look at something about the world in a different way. And so in that sense, humor can also be transformative and that it changes how you see the world. And so in that sense, you know, even, even though humor can just be very silly and then, you know, and I, I, I embrace that, but it can also be, you know, again, transformative at the same time. You mentioned briefly about progressive rock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you know, uh, I know you are a big fan of progressive rock. Um, many affiliations, association, and fascination with this genre or the style of music. What aspects of this genre or style of music do you think benefited you or could enrich people's lives? Hmm. Well, I don't know about enriching people's lives because 
musical taste is very subjective. Um, so just, just speaking for me, um, I, you know, my, my older sister wanted to take piano lessons. So my, my parents bought a piano and they kind of figured, well, if they're buying this piano and they're paying for my sister to take piano lessons, they may as well have me take piano lessons too. And, you know, I kind of hated it. And um, I didn't really much, you know, see the point because they're just making me play this boring, you know, classical stuff. But I was, you know, classically trained. And uh, when I finally got far enough in my studies and old enough, you know, my teacher started saying, well, you can start picking your own songs that you want to learn and, and play. It's like, yeah, I can learn to play pop music and rock and roll. I love rock <laughs> and roll. And then having, you know, again, played the challenging classical stuff, you know, I realized that rock and roll is kind of simple. It's not very challenging and it wasn't, it didn't take long to learn. And it just, it wasn't as much fun to play as it was to listen to, you know, and, um, and then I discovered, you know, progressive rock, which, um, you know, everyone probably has their own definition of, of what this is. But for me, it's, it was this, this movement in rock and roll that tried to expand the possibilities of what rock and roll could be. And it did that by borrowing from other genres kind of shamelessly. And so it incorporated classical music and jazz and blues and boogie woogie and folk music and world music. And, and, and in so doing, you know, by using things like odd time signatures or, I mean, you know, extended voicings, you know, not, not just the one, three, five, or, you know, you know Pete Townsend, Townsend from who said it's really the one and the five, that's the rock and roll. Uh, but then you get sevenths and ninths and augmented chords and tritones and quartal harmony and all this other stuff. And all of that together just so much expands the vocabulary that it, it just sounds different. It sounds fresher. It sounds different. It's not just the same thing over and over and over again. And that's whether you're talking about, you know, the arrangement, and, but that also extends to a lot of the subject matter because, you know, people make fun of prog rock as being all, you know, wizards and fairies and stuff like that. But it's, that's not really true either, but it just, but it is true that prog rock tends to be about more than just love songs. You know, there are certainly prog rock love songs, but they try to talk about other things as well. And so that's, that's what I like, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging because it's, 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 technically more demanding than, you know, regular rock and roll. <laughs> um, and, you know, the subject matter is also more challenging. And again, I think that that kind of goes back to, you know, my, my nature of trying to be kind of disciplined and intellectual. And um, that, again, I think, and much is the same way that this Western ceremonial stuff with tables of correspondences and learning this stuff and keeping a diary and all that stuff appeals to me. So does the, the challenge, you know, and the mastery that's involved in prog rock challenge my ears and my thinking about music. So, you know, I think those two things kind of go naturally together for me. It's, it's really just kind of all about challenging myself artistically, spiritually, you know, intellectually. Yeah. Yes, very, very fascinating. Progressive rock also is, um, you know, one of my favorite, probably one of my favorite styles, if not the favorite style. And, you know, for those people who are tuning in right now or have reached this part of the interview, progressive rock was a style of rock music, which came out in the late 60s, around 67 or 68. Uh, with bands which influenced the style like Brooklyn Harem, King Crimson, and of course, the, you know, in the early 70s to the mid 70s was also the heyday of progressive rock. So it was very short lived, but it was probably one of the most adventurous, explorative musical styles because it incorporated, as Richard mentioned, classical music, jazz music, rock music. And, you know, so really, really moving into different territories, you know, challenging the conventional structure of how a song should be, at least in a mainstream sense, in a traditional sense, to some level, at least in popular culture. 
and you had you know different instrumentations you know different forms of instruments yes. different genres different lyrical themes it challenged uh, i think the listener as well as it did to the musician so it's a demanding form of music but there were bands who had songs which were quite accessible to some level as well i mean Emerson Lake and Farmer had a song called Lucky Man, you know, and that was, you know, it, it had its, it, uh, it had its uh, radio time, it had its airplay as well. Um, even oh, right. Peter Gabriel's song, Salisbury Hill. I mean, that's, that's a toe-tapping song, but it's in seven. <laughs> yes, and even people like, like you mentioned, Peter Gabriel, even Phil Collins came from the progressive rock world. You know, he had a very successful pop career, but he was a drummer for Genesis and for Brand X, and Brand X had an album, Unorthodox, oh, yes. uh, Unorthodox Behavior, I think that was in 76. And I've never heard a drummer like, I've never heard Phil Collins play like that. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so while we're still on prog rock, we still have a bit of time. Um, you know, a few more minutes before we go into the last question to wrap things up. What are some of your, uh, would you like to share with the, with your fans, with your viewers, what are some of the, uh, rock rock albums or artists which has influenced you over the years? Well, I have to say num number one was someone that you mentioned, Emerson Lake and Palmer. Um, and that's, ha and the reason for that is that again, being, you know, classically trained and then kind of, I don't know, being kind of underwhelmed by the time I started learning, you know, how to play pop music. And then hearing Keith Emerson, whose ability is just, you know, prodigious. I mean, his, his chops are just off the scale. I mean, there's, you know, nobody else you know, in, in, in the world of prog rock in my mind that comes close. Um, to just the the level of accomplishment and difficulty in what he plays and the first time i heard that first elp album the one with lucky man that you mentioned it just blew my mind it was just this is what i want to do you know i, I want to play this um you know and if and if there's any any critique one could have of elp it's that um in their live performances they tend to kind of go on a little bit with their solos and that gets and those get tend to get a little bit of a little indulgent and so that which kind of leads me to uh the second band i like to mention which is yes and they're in many ways are probably my favorite prog rock band because they're just their ensemble playing is just so good and and they, and they maintain kind of that balance and you know they 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 don't they haven't quite gone overboard, you know, in the same way that, you know, uh, ELP could. And, and, the, and, and they really struck this balance between complexity and accessibility. You know, a lot of their songs are very pleasant to listen to. And, um, God, there's so many other bands. I mean, you know, the early Genesis stuff, uh, UK. Uh, there's, a, you know, I've got some friends in a Philadelphia-based band called Echo Lynn. Um, who came out in like the late 80s and early 90s and are still recording today and their, their stuff is just fantastic. And I think that's that's an important thing to remember too is that, you know, while you said the prog rock was kind of short-lived, you know, it actually continued, you know, into like the 80s with bands like Marillion. Today, you know, you see, you know, the groups, you know, like, you know, Dream Theater and Opeth and Porcupine Tree and folks like that. So it's it's still a very active scene. It's just not, it's not quite as mainstream or top of the charts as it was in the seventies. Yes. Yes, definitely. D different forms, you know, people from different styles of music, as you mentioned, are being influenced by progressive rock, the legacy of progressive rock. You know, a lot of the bands like Rush and Yes still continued recording albums into the eighties and whatnot. Um, you know, some of them formed, side bands or projects like Asia, Foreigner, you know, which were more uh, like Arena Rock, I would think, <laughs> AOR. <laughs> but it was still good. 
And I even think of albums like, you know, the Decemberists album, The Crane Wife, or um, just the, the new one from Vampire Weekend, uh, The Father of the Bride. I mean, those are very, very adventurous albums. And I, you know, yeah, I listen to those and I really hear callbacks to, um, you know, prog rock, Jeff Rotol, Frank Zappa and things like that. And it's, it's really cool to see, um, you know, these newer and mainstream bands kind of doing those sorts of call-outs, whether it's intentional or not, or whether it's just me hearing that, you know, because that's where I'm coming from. But it's, it's still, it's really, really cool to hear. Yes. Yeah, so you've mentioned your favorite pro albums. Um, for someone who's very new to the Western magical tradition, uh, would you have any recommendations of uh, source material for books or any primary sources you could quote, which has influenced you? Oh, for the Western esoteric tradition. Um, you know, it kind of depends on where you are coming from. Because there's just, there's just so many roads of entry, depending on whether you want to, you know, whether you want to do, you know, Wicca, for instance. And, and there's just been this whole literature that's um, opened up recently there. Um, there. There have been books written recently about how to use magic for protest, you know, and because people are very concerned about the state of the world now and there's, there's, you know, books in that genre, or if you just kind of want to get straight into it for uh, the practice, I mean, just, you want to do golden dawn, you want to do Thalema and so on. Um, so it's kind of hard to recommend just one book. Um, you know, you would, you would ask me to have, have ready for this interview, some of my, my own stuff. Yeah. At the, at the risk of suddenly like I'm plugging myself, um, I, I would say that if you're interested in getting a sense of you know, who Aleister Crowley is and what he's about, um, you, know, you had mentioned the, my book Perdurabo, which is the biography of Aleister Crowley. Um, so that's you know it's a, it's a it's a kind of a, it's a hefty book. It's a lot a lot to read, but it tells you about his his life in a lot of detail. Um, but if you just want something a little quicker and easier that not only covers his life, but also just just like kind of like a quick handy overview of, you know, the sorts of magical practice he talked about. I've got a book called The Wiser Concise Guide to Aleister Crowley. And a lot of people out there have found it to be a very useful book. Um, when, I, when I wrote this, the, the goal was to, I don't write the book that I wish I had access to when I was that 14 year old kid trying to understand what the heck is Crowley's book magic and theory and practice all about. And um, so again, I'm, I'm very gratified that, that that was my goal. And a lot of people continue to recommend this book very highly as a great first book or early book. If you want to get into um, Alistair Crowley's style of magic. Um, but, you know, beyond that, I mean, you know, again, it kind of would depend on what specifically you want to get into. Yes. You know, big world you know it's yeah there's so many different traditions some stemming off from each other some which were different but comparable you know i think to add to that uh the books uh richard has mentioned i mean you had agrippa uh three books on occult philosophy um for people who are interested in the works of John D. There's a whole library of material there as well. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I, I could mention, like for example, Stephen Skinner um, and his publishing company um, is just putting out this whole series of you know source works of Western esotericism and and just everything from you know the Greek magical papyri to the Key of Solomon and all this, and just doing these really excellent you know facsimiles of um, works on, on magic. And, and, and Steve Skinner is certainly not the only one. I mean, you, you'll also find books like this coming out from, you know, Llewellyn through a uh, Scarlet Imprint. Uh, they just put out the, the, the book. Oh, I, I forget the title of it, but you know, there's a lot of people who are doing these, you know, grimoire, you know, re reissuing these grimoires that just have been sitting around the libraries as manuscripts. And as well as a lot of people like, uh, you know, Jake Stratton and Kent, who are kind of trying to synthesize and, um, you know, kind of pull out what, are, what is the essence of these ancient practices and kind of try to re-understand them in, you know, a, a more modern sensibility. So, yeah, 
just just so many yeah so many ways you could, you could find an entry and and again i think that just reflects what i said earlier that there there isn't a one size fits all kind of answer and you know if if this is something that interests you i would say that if you if you try one of these things you know if you try you know the goetia and and you don't like it and then then don't give up i mean it's like try something else try philema try the golden dawn try you know rosicrucianism or something else you know and um there, there's a lot of different things it's just a matter of finding the one that suits you yes definitely um, I think it mentions uh, also back to the first question or second question we had also is about investigating on our own, you know, and seeing what works for us at this current time and also going through our experience, not only from the word of others, but also trying to relate that with our personal relatable experience and, and also our intention and aspirations are important as well. To see which suits suits us. So, right, right. Now, yeah. So to look back to the beginning, you know, we were talking about um, being being grounded, but at the same time being open. And um, in my doctoral dissertation, I did try to look at what are some of the personality traits that are associated with metaphysical um, beliefs and experiences, and the I just turned out that the best predictor of somebody having some sort of a transformative metaphysical experience, I mean, that sort of thing that blows your socks off and changes you and the way you see the world, um, the best predictor of that is questing. Is, it was kind of the term in psychology, the idea that you, you, you don't think you have the answers. You, know, you're, you're not, you don't know it all. That the idea that your, con your life is constantly one of looking for new information and reevaluating what you know. And if you are open to new information, then you are in a position where you are open to having that sort of transformative experience. So, um, you know, keep, keep your mind open and keep the options open and keep, keep questioning and keep questing. Yes, keeping an open mind, keeping an open heart, um, also to investigate, to keep questioning, and cost consistency as well, you know, and, and, and being open to evolve and being open to grow. And you've mentioned a lot of uh, very fascinating and insightful uh, sharings today. Um, yeah, so I will include links for Richard's work in the description, the YouTube description, and also his website and any relevant details where you can find out more information about his works, more information about his music, about his academic profession as well. And yeah, just to add to that, I mean, um, you know, when I was doing my, my research as well, I mean, Walter Hanegraaff and Nicholas Goodrick Clark, very essential as well. Uh, yes. They've contributed quite a lot of work towards um, academic studies of Western esoteric tradition, hermetic tradition. And yeah, so I mean, um, to wrap it up. It's just dropping names here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So to, to, to wrap it up as well, uh, just to share a short story as well. Um, you mentioned uh, Dr. Stephen Skinner. And I got to know Alistair Crowley through one of his books called Millennium Prophecies. And I was only six years old. <laughs> and I had the book Millennium Prophecies. It was about how paranormal investigation, there was a bit of conspiracy theory in there. It was like a whole like a compendium. And I came to this page and it was the great big, uh, the, the great beast 666, the Antichrist. And I was, Wow, who is this guy <laughs> at, six, <laughs> at six years old? <laughs> so, the, you know, and yeah, always, uh, he also mentioned Madame Blavatsky in that book. So I was fascinated by a lot of these things since a young age and uh, UFOs and, and ghosts and, you know, the, the, whole, the whole, everything, you know. So it's really cool that we have this mutual interest with, Progressive rock, the occult, academia, 
And I hope this conversation, this interview discussion has been really beneficial to whoever has tuned in and whoever will tune in in the future. So Dr. Richard Kaczynski, thank you once again for your time. My pleasure. Thank you once again for being so patient with the, the amount of technic technical difficulties I had to deal with this morning. Different, new lap computers, so. <laughs> different laptops, different uh, Zoom accounts. And yeah, so, um, you know, we've covered a lot of uh, valuable information, invaluable information today. I hope you check out his links, check out his books, check out his music. And thank you once again. Any last words from you, Richard? Uh, I think I just reiterate what I said earlier. Just, you know, keep on questioning and keep on questing. Whether it's, you know, mysticism or music or whatever, you know, is your path. Just uh, keep, keep looking and stay open to new things. Yes. Okay. Stay open and keep going. Thank you.